and welcome to this week's Supercharged podcast. This is a particularly interesting podcast because uh, this week it's, we're actually just going to play a recording uh, of an interview that actually I did with Professor Fraser, I think about eight, eight years ago now. Peter, um, well, he was both a mentor uh, and he was also our he was also our chief scientific officer of the company Ness Health. And um, in this interview, basically, he really, really describes how bioenergetics is able to go beyond biochemistry. And you know, you'll just get a sense of the depth of the research uh, that we were doing at the time and his you know his very unique look of the physics of biology, you know, which is, well, it's still today a, a, a relatively unknown field. And, and he, he literally, uh, well, he literally is one of the pioneers of, of this field. And, um, you know, he's a, he's a great friend and our business partner uh, for 10 years uh, until, until he died about five years ago. Uh, anyway, I just thought I would, I think you will all really, really enjoy this interview. And, um, just sit back, relax, and uh, take it all in. Bye for now. 1973, I set up an acupuncture college, um, which, after 13 years of hard work, was accepted into the tertiary college system as a university course, one of the first in the Western world for Chinese medicine. And uh, I promptly left. Um, what is a change of scene and it was then I started doing there was a lot about Chinese medicine I just didn't understand even though I was teaching it for 13 years I still didn't understand it and so I began to research um, aspects of it that I was interested in and so between 1983 to the present I've been um, on this quest to try and uh, sort out once and for all what on earth this um, alternative medicine is about and uh, from the questions you ask I think yeah I've been there you know so um, yes yeah, very much a journey of the last 30 years or so. As a teenager and later I, I did yoga <clears throat> and I studied yogic philosophy and then I studied the Buddhist psychology if you like um, about mind and body stuff. This is way back 1970s and you remember oh you don't there's the hippie days and that didn't satisfy me I, I've got this great desire for closure thing I want things to fit and then I found Chinese medicine uh, which began in Melbourne and uh, I became the principal of the college that I attended because I have a teaching background and degree and um, none of it made any sense because the Indian material in yoga and the Chinese material don't fit, and neither of them fit with medicine. And then I found later on the quest was um, biology and physics. Why doesn't biology fit with physics? And we have all these bits and pieces of material about us and our health and, and our well being that don't fit together. I, I couldn't make sense. I, I'm very good at trying to fit something together, make closure, if you like. And that's, to me, very satisfying to say, oh, at last we understand it. And so what's happened now, I've managed to fit a whole lot together in different systems of, uh, of medicine from thousands of years ago to the present. And I don't think there's a whole lot of medicines. I think there's one medicine, but we don't understand it very well. And I include myself in that. And I think uh, a certain amount of it was I lost a great number of teeth when I was a teenager. I was forced to go to dentists and have more and more extractions and so on. So, yeah, you're, you're right. I, I did have a reason. I couldn't understand why I kept getting abscesses in my mouth. And then even 2003, when I met Harry, I was still getting abscesses in the ears. It's only 2008. Now I understand. It's gone. But now I understand what was happening all my life from age 15 to age 50-something. So I guess, yeah, it sounds a bit silly to you, but it was important to me. I wanted to know what on earth could be going on. Like Harry, I managed to get chronic fatigue. 
uh, fairly badly. How did my uh, at the age of 50, I gave up natural medicine well and truly. I was so sick and tired of herbalists, homeopaths, and hands on people and massage. Oh, I can fix that. All you do is. Uh, they're making, you know, people get tired of the outrageous claims and the, the silliness. And I thought there must be an underlying framework that all of these things that work a bit are referring to. There must be a big theory of medicine that includes Reiki, massage, taking pills, yoga, and so on, homeopathy, or this sort of thing. They're all completely different, but what's the same about them is that they're all about giving information to the body. I can say that now in, in 10 seconds, but uh, it took 35 years to be able to see it because uh, they've all got, one thing natural medicine's got is a, a lot of theories, you see, but they're not interested. To me, it either works or it doesn't work. I couldn't tell you how many ideas I've dropped, perfectly respectable ideas out of books from, about natural medicine. And I, I studied books on herbalism, I studied books on homeopathy, I studied books on meditation. It went on and on. I just naturally gravitate to it. And I guess I was very disillusioned about the whole trip um, because they talk such a lot of nonsense and they're well-meaning, lovely people and they're nice. And I said, yeah, you say this works and then you do it and it doesn't work. And the thing that uh, natural medicine lacks is this underlying framework and this repeatability. It's got to work in a substantial number of cases. Or people just say, yeah, it was just one of those things, you know, anecdote. If you get 100 people and 80 of them out of the 100 show significant improvement, that's, that's a scientific sort of a statement or premise of interest. With an infraceutical treatment, we put them through a diagnostic matching test to see what they're like. Are you like this? Are you like that? Every now and then you hit one and say, yes, it's like that, or yes, it's like that. And um, we treat the healthy part of the body and leave the sick bit alone. That's the opposite of what everybody else does. We treat health, not sickness. And so if you've got psoriasis, you say, well, psoriasis usually get on the elbows, knees, and maybe the, around the ears or something. You treat the good parts of the skin and um, see what happens. You see, we can't make any claim until we get a whole rigmarole explaining what, what it's all about. No one can fix psoriasis. Everybody can fix it and it comes back next week. <clears throat> so <clears throat> we took another approach and we said, well, we've got a medical system that hands out drugs that are toxic to anybody at the drop of a hat or less. We've got a hospital system that takes bits out if they don't work. Would you go to a mechanic with your Ferrari and they said, this bit doesn't work, this bit doesn't work? Because I saw a guy doing a, a ride on mower and he's throwing bits out that didn't, didn't need. And sure, your body can keep working pretty well with a whole lot of its bits, but I don't see health as handing out toxic substances or removing bits that don't work. I see it as making it work better than it was. And Harry says this wonderful idea, we can change ourselves as people, we can develop, and we can get over our problems and they disappear, they, they melt away. And we ended up talking about healthcare instead of medicine. And you say, well, we need medicine. You get a broken leg or a broken neck or in a car accident, you've got to have emergency care. And they're very good, very devoted at it. 
So I don't see the conflict. So we come down to saying, well, there's a certain number of people in the community who want to achieve more, get rid of some of their aches and pains and ailments, and we can help them, we can show them how to do it. I think the biggest Eureka moment, I'm still having them, but we realised that the, the body's more than a bag of chemicals. The treating at the chemi chemical level is fine. But uh, it's as if, uh, what's the use of talking to the employees when you can go to the head office? and we're looking for the control system. Can we correct where the problem's going wrong instead of the... If you look at me, if you ask me, the, the disease is a, a car crash. It's what happened as a result. And we need to go back 200 metres to find out what started the car crash. So if you like, why treat the result when you can get at the cause? And the, the cause is by no means clear. And what we've done is try to use Chinese medicine and Indian, traditional Indian Ayurvedic medicine ideas, which are very ancient. And uh, they've stood the tests of time. They're still going, you know. And we thought that we're picking up clues from, uh, from tracing ancient med medical systems and finding a scientific way of evaluating them. Otherwise, if you haven't got some way of testing something, you're a philosopher. If you've got a testing, a rigorous objective test, you're a scientist. And I think I'd rather go to a scientist than a philosopher for, for health and healing. Um, I want to know that something has been tried properly and evaluated properly. So um, that's what happened. The biggest the biggest breakthrough was finding in the middle 90s, 1990s, a way of, a, a tool for measurement of something that uh, we'd been trying to measure for uh, 80 years. The physicists didn't know how to make measurements of the quantum field. And so they got elaborate mathematics devised by Richard Feynman and other great physicists. They've done it. We know how the quantum field works, but we still can't measure it. And I think the greatest thing that we've done in 20 or so years of research is to find a way of how the, how the field works, which will, which will trick us into telling us what's happening. If energy moves through space, it creates a field. Why it does this is because the energy is itself structured. And what we've been looking at, as Harry said, we're looking at the structure of matter, which is in fact just energy in space. And believe it or not, uh, the physics of space hasn't been studied. They've studied everything else, but space is full of waves. And uh, we, we've found ways to evaluate what we think is happening in space because we're getting interreactions of different fields. Like, can you imagine the complexity of the body, the number of interreacting fields that are there, if the fields are the control mechanism for the body and the cause of disease? It's so complex, it's very daunting to know where would you start to try to sort it out? And the beautiful thing, the Chinese have already got it into categories today. Can you believe that we found out that ancient Chinese medical knowledge was spot on right, but just not expressed in a scientific way? So that, that you know, we've been, we've been kicking goals for years. And we're getting to the point now where we can put up a hand here. I think we've kicked some goals here. And uh, maybe we can help with health care. That's the stage of development we're at. But we can see it's got enormous possibilities that have been overlooked for a long time in our culture. It's like Zen Buddhism. It's being able to see things as they really are without preconception. 
Can you believe how hard it is not to have preconceptions about medicine and health? Because from the moment you're born, somebody's telling you, oh, don't do this, do this. And uh, it's, uh, it's brainwashing. It's just starting again from scratch is what I tried to do. And with no preconceptions, you ask very basic questions about what is energy? Does it move? Why does it move? How does it react with other energy? So on. We had to go back to very, very basic particle physics to get a paradigm to explain what was happening in what we thought was happening in Chinese medicine. This colon meridian is supposed to be an energy channel. You say, what sort of energy is it? Why can't anyone detect it? This is the scientist's approach. You've got to say what the energy is. Is it electromagnetic? Is it magnetic? Is it, is, is it some sort of quantum field? Is it electrical? Is it photonic? That's the only energies there are. I'm sorry, that's it. The first thing we discovered, there was there's no mysterious life energy that the physicists haven't discovered yet. That was all, you know, chi, the life energy, no. So that was the, you know, one big theory down the drain. And we said, but there's something about quantum physics that looks really interesting. We know we can't detect a physical energy channel in the body. We don't have any device to, to, to measure it or track it uh, because we don't know what the energy is. And we started there, what kind of energy is traveling through the body that's supposed to be the control system? And uh, if so, how would we measure it? And uh, it was a long series of fortuitous events led us towards finding physicists existing two or three big physicists who are on our side, who are saying what we're saying, that agree with my own observations. And uh, this happened recently. We finally found Milo Wolf, a physicist in America, whose idea of the structure of the atom enabled us to have energy traveling from one place to another between people, around people, out into space and so on. We got a, a connected view of the universe that means information is everywhere and is available. Physicists and chemists, biophysicists, don't like action at a distance much because it requires a field theory and that's a bit hard. In order to get chemistry to work, you've got to get the atoms, molecules have to be next to each other. And this clearly cannot be so if there's a control system that's got to work at a distance. You've got to have every cell of the body has to know what every other cell is doing. And it's not going to say, hello, Charlie, this is happening here, and then nudge the next one, nudge the next one, so many billion cells. It's got to be instantaneous. Not in other words, it can't be chemical. Chemistry's too slow. So we come back to the field theory of biology, which was popular in the 20, 1920s, and it was dropped because the chemical company said, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, we're going for a chemical model of the body. And the doctors decided, yeah, that's all right. The laws of physics take precedence over the laws of chemistry. That's a big statement, and uh, I think most scientists would agree, unless you're a, phys unless you're a chemist. So everything has to um, obey the laws of energy, which is physics, and that includes chemistry. So uh, yeah, it's a technical, um, it's sort of an in thing. You have to know that the physics is the boss and the chemistry has to do what is possible in physics. And it's, then we found that modern medicine and modern biochemistry doesn't match back to physics. They're, it's like two different worlds, as you say. Oh, surely one's this and one's that. But one must control the other according to, um, according to the structure of matter. Chemistry can only do what is in the rule book. The rule book's the physics. You see what I mean? And um, trying to find a doctor who knew any physics, let alone they know biochemistry. 
And that's not their, that's all they're taught. That's not their fault. So uh, what we've seen is um, maybe over-specialisation has caused this appalling problem where biology and physics don't match up. And we're saying, well, they've got to match up if there's a control system. And if we find a control system, it's going to be a physics field control system. And I'm not a physicist. I'm, a, I'm an old school teacher that, that got into Chinese medicine, you know. I had to sit up late in the night reading physics books that were sort of door stoppers with big words. And um, I could find nothing in the physics book for years that matched what I could see happening in my experiments using Chinese medical experiments. Finally, we finally found Feynman and interreactions. Feynman is about reactions of light with electron and interreactions of energy between particles. And it might seem a long shot as having anything to do with medicine, but it makes a field. It makes something called the quantum electrodynamic field. We said, yeah, because I'd done experiments showing we could block, we get a field. I found out how to set up a QED field. Have you ever thought why we don't get too hot and burn up? How is it that the body manages to keep the temperature if your core temperature of your body changes by one degree centigrade, more, about 1.5, you die. How does the body, night and day, and fair weather and foul, manage to adjust the body's temperature to within one degree for 70 or 80 years? I don't think anyone knows how the body regulates its temperature. And I don't think, you know, we're talking about basics. How does the body regulate its blood pressure, its temperature, its pH, and so your heart rate? All the big ones. And they say, oh, it's the midbrain. This is the normal neurological response. They say, and what controls the midbrain? You remember that picture of the elephant supporting the earth? And then one bright spark in ancient Greece said, yeah, but what's supporting the elephants? And they said, it's another set of elephants. So it's one of those. You've got to say, supposing we don't have elephants, say, well, what is controlling the midbrain? And then you say, well, I don't know. You've got to get something that's autocephalous. Can I say autocephalous? It means having its own brain, having its own head. Our bodies adjust themselves. They don't need that much. We need to refer to outside. But our body adjusts its own pH, its own temperature, its own blood pressure, and so on. It knows when to stop growing and when to start. And it's saying, how does it know, you know, what is the... And until now, everybody said, oh, there's genes, you know. It doesn't appear as if the ge geneticists are able to give us enough uh, to convince us that that is the control system. And more and more I'm convinced that it's not the control system of the body. It's it's the library of the body to remember how to make 200,000 proteins. It's not the same as remembering the mechanism for adjustment, very fine adjustments of temperature and pressure over your lifespan. So we, we went for a field which is able to do things long distance. The only kind of field we could find that measured up uh, people think, oh yeah, we've got an electrical field and a lot of work's been done on that for 40 years on the uh, electrical characteristic of the body. It's not an electrical field that we, we've, we've found that that's not enough to explain it all. It's got to have information in it. It's the information is the control and the field is the carrier. So what we're saying hasn't been said before. We're saying you've, it, it, for, to get a medical system to go, you've got to have a carrier and you've got to have information, energy and information together 
means control system. Uh, it's not easy stuff. We were lucky enough to get clues about uh, the details of a control system straight out of a physics experiment that I did that actually Harry put me up to. Uh, a fairly far out experiment, he suggested. He turned out he was right. Now, all of this sounds like something out of fantasy land. And so we do the ultimate test in science is, does it work? And so uh, I've got a big rubbish bin full of bottles of things that didn't work. I've got tons of things. Every now and then you'd find something interesting. You keep with that. So the big test doesn't work. If it doesn't work, I dropped it. And I've been dropping things for 30 years that didn't work. And we're left with a very small proportion of things that have an effect. So I'm saying this has all worked out on trial and error. And that is a monumental effort of, um, of testing over years and years. Yeah, the, the, the independent scientists are going to ask for an objective measurement. And you know how there's always a catch-22, particularly with something new. Since 1923, when quantum physics was born, there's been no way of adequately measuring what's happening. And in fact, they've put since 1923 to about 1984 with Richard Feynman, he developed a, a mathematical model for predicting what was happening. But no one can measure it directly. If you can't measure, you haven't got any data, you haven't got any science. You see our problem? We were up against a baffling problem of quantum physics because we, I became certain that it was a quantum field and what was that? And I read everything I could about it. All of the millions of cells in the body have to be regulated in a time space of your life within very narrow parameters or you die. How is it that from the tip of your toe to the top of your head, there is some information that all the cells are getting that is keeping it exactly right to, to sustain life. And the medical traditional idea is that it's hormones and enzymes. You know how long it takes enzymes and hormones to get from here to there? Minutes. We've got to have an instantaneous control system that is able to adjust very finely. And we found Interestingly enough, the biologists have found that all the processes in, in the body are like a gradual switch. You know, you get a switch just on or off, two positions. The body's not like that. It turns off gradually. Can you imagine what sort of mechanism is required to get a switch from full on to full off? That's pretty sophisticated, and your body does it with all the major activities of your body. How is this possible? What is the mechanism? And then the problems we had were immense because you only get a field when you get energy moving from one spot to another. And no field if it's stationary. And then we found, aha, we found a physicist who says that matter puts out a field anyway, just by being there. And we said, that's the one we want. We don't want an electrical field because we've got to have a zap going from here, a zap going back. And you, you know, we'd have to run it on a battery. And I, I haven't found any batteries in the body. I haven't found any radio transmitters in the body. Um, if they did, they'd think I was schizophrenic. And um, you see what I mean? We found that the quantum field is exactly right for what we want. And then the extraordinary thing is we found that when you get a certain structure of a quantum field, it has certain characteristics. The extraordinary thing was we found the body was living off energy from space, just what is there, and that you needed, you needed the food because of what's in it. The extraordinary thing, everybody thinks we get energy from carbohydrates and fats and so on. 
Then when you look at the fine print in the biological textbooks, you find, ah, it's the bonds between the C's, O's and H's in the carbohydrate that the body... And what the bonds are just magnetic energy. And I like it. We live on energy and everything else is to get the energy to us. So, um, I must admit I've spent many a night in complete despair and bafflement about how on earth could this be so? And how can the ideas of bi biology be so wrong, you know? Uh, and you, you shake your head and you go, that, that couldn't be right. Uh, I know we live on Mars bars, you know? I know it's really chocolate that we all want. And um, people don't go running around saying, oh dear, I, I need my magnetic fix, you know. It's not like that. But um, we're reluctantly looking at these ideas as a possibility. And the glorious thing is when we go back to Chinese medicine and see where do they think you got the energy from. And they've got this thing called Yuan or source energy that comes from the air. Everybody knows how to turn the, the um, nervous system off. You have an anaesthetic. Great. We need that for operations. Does anyone know how to make the nervous system work better? And here's where we get the control system. In a moment of complete abandonment, I got a psychology, I did psychology at university, and I remember you've got brain waves. And I said, let's make an infraceutical out of alpha, beta, gamma, and delta waves that for some odd reason, the brain, manuf the brain wouldn't manufacture all these brain waves for no purpose, would it? And I don't know what they're doing there. And I said, well, maybe that's the carrier wave for a lot of information in the nervous system through the body field. Aha! So what we did was I got analogues and put them in, imprinted it into the medicine, into, oh, we're not allowed to say medicine, into the infraceutical, into the health device, whatever it's called, and bingo! We got amazing improvements in the activity of the nervous system with, uh, with me, with Harry, lots of people. And this is the first time anyone had made the nervous system work better. You can't make the nervous system work better by taking drugs or vitamin pills or anything. Because nobody knows how the nervous system works. So how can you make it work better? And we're saying, well, the nervous system is obviously a key part of the body field because the nervous system's got electric charge. You don't get a quantum field until you've got an electric charge and you've got electric charge straight down your spine. Love it. So we were develop. this is all complicated stuff, but the point was we got the nervous system to work better and we called it nerve driver because it helps the energy field of the nerves. And we didn't do it by chemicals, we did it by low frequency sound. Here you've got to have knowledge about how the field is structured, what the different frequency ranges are, if there is a frequency range, how strong it has to be, you know, there's all the scientific parameters. All structures have a resonant frequency. We found in the Neijing Su Wen, ancient Chinese textbook of medicine, or Neijing Su Wen, it says, the heart is like an orb. An orb collects energy from space. It's like a collector. It's like a battery. And attached to that is this energy pathway called the heart meridian. And then the stomach is a different shape, a different frequency, another little energy pathway. So we went through the 12 major organs of the body and said, ah, We've got a pathway going this at a certain frequency range. Then we had structure in the human body related directly to its to what it looks like. And it was beautiful. The Chinese did it 2800 BC. And I did it again in 1990 something, you know. It's not new, but what is new about it is we can extend it and make it scientific so we know what we're talking about. The, uh, the Chinese medicine is very poetic and mostly impossible to understand 
at least for the first 20 years. So what we're doing is what science is about is refining knowledge and making it more accurate and so you can communicate it. I couldn't talk to anyone about Chinese medicine if there's something wrong with the Chung Mai, the chung mai or Dai Mai is empty. And I, Sorry, what did you say? Nobody wants to know all that stuff. They want to know why have I got ingrown toenails or why have I got stomach cancer and can you fix it? You see what I mean? We've got a long way still to go before we can apply energetic medicine directly to a stated modern disease because we're still back, still grappling with the idea of structure creating a meridian. Well, it's pretty it's simple, right. isn't it? It shouldn't be there, so we take it out. That's pr pretty basic. What we're saying is a bit more sophisticated. and saying cancer is a loss of control of growth. I go, right, you say, but what loss is of it? Loss control of growth, what do you mean by that? Why do we look like this and not like somebody else? We've got a body field that makes us look like us and it keeps us looking like us all our life. So loss of control of growth means something in the body field fails and it's got to be linked to the DNA, RNA, because that's about manufacturing new proteins for growth. So there is a link to DNA, but we're saying, well, it's maybe a, more of a passive link. And maybe if we can just correct the information system that's going to the DNA and back, we can affect the cancer in a good way. So if you're going to try and explain what you're trying to do, you have to say your body has forgotten what you look like. And that's a good psychological one, as you're saying, what do you look like inside? As we're saying, it's the, it's the mental mindset that has a lot to do with the blockages that occur in the human body. For not all of them, but let's not overlook them either. So, yeah, that's what I do to explain it. And they, uh, often, these explanations, they, t that they love. They think, oh, oh, that's what I always thought. Well, that's the trouble. They've come to me for health, and um, they've got a lot of stuff in their head that has to go. And one of these is, is the big F, the fear. Um, the fear is exacerbated by the um, health professionals these days. And I don't think it helps. And, um, and everybody gets this fear. And the, the extraordinary emotional charge, I mean, you can die of alcoholism, nobody cares. You die of cancer, oh, awful. People die of all sorts of things. But cancer's got this big emotional charge because it's an emotional disease. Willem Reich said that 40, 50 years ago. It's not new. And people still can't grapple with the idea. In the 1920s, that before a cancer develops, the nerve to that organ starts behaving strangely. How could this be? And yet we've known this for 70, 80 years. And it's quite clear that the nervous system has a role, partly a role, in the initiation of this lack of control over growth. But what indeed it looks like now is a massive dropout in the body communication system. And does the therapist say, well, we soon have to get you back in touch with yourself? Now, what therapist says that? They start saying, well, you've got to have vitamin C and you've got to have lots of root vegetables, and all this stuff. You know I agree with the FDA. I mean, have you ever spoken to anyone who agrees with the FDA before? The Food and Drug Administration in America said that cancer is not a nutritional disease. I might be the only person in the world who agrees with them, but there's nutritional things that can help you, but it's not a nutritional disease. And I've been testing well, since about 1992, I can't find a link, There's no direct link. And then when you start saying, well, would you, what about sorting yourself out? Is your home, your job, your sex life, your marriage, why do you kick the dog? Of course, the shutter come out, I don't want to know, I just want you to get me better. And the way to get better is to go inside 
and see what the conflicts are. And that's something nobody wants to do. And if you say, well, look, if you don't do this, you're going to get sicker and sicker. And then you're threatening them. You know, you're in a, as a therapist, you're in this position where you can't do anything because they isolate them. So I have to do something to you. And I say, no, you do something to yourself. And I think all the speakers at this weekend have been saying, you take control, decide what you're going to do, and minimize the conflicts and find out about yourself. They're the people who get better. You as a person are learning to grow as a person. And when you grow, you become healthy. You keep growing till the day before you die. I'm not sure about the actual day, but we're talking about health as a growth process, as an ongoing way of dealing with the, uh, the, the, the problems that come up. Why don't you think about yourself as an information system instead of a bag of chemicals? You might get somewhere. Where are you getting your energy from and what are you doing with it? So I've seen people go red in the face and cry and break down and have a moment of elation and happiness. And uh, you know, when you get rid of the blockages, something dramatic happens. And bioenergetic medicine has been trying to do this for many, many years. And you know what defeats it from Freud and Reich and all the bioenergetic idealists over a hundred years is ourselves. We block our own energy because uh, fear, it's inconvenient, it's embarrassing, uh, loss of a feeling of who you are and so on. And maybe, maybe, just maybe, the um, new energetic system we've developed is helping them to get over that huge disability, particularly for males. The males don't want to lose power, particularly in front of another male, because headbutting, you know, males have to do this eternal headbutting uh, to show their, their power, virility, and uh, superior equipment, and so on. So what we're saying is, you've got to drop all that and go inside and feel what's happening to your energy. And of course, the, have you ever thought of asking the people who've recovered from cancer what they did? <laughs> and nobody ever thought of that. No ethics sciences institutes doing that, you know, wonderful. Instead of thinking of a new wonder drug, you say, the people who got better, what were they doing? Were they eating lots of green vegetables or chewing up tablets or what exactly was going on? And you find they often can't verbalize what it was. Well, at this weekend, we had this wonderful lady who had the brain cancer who just disappeared over, what was it, 18 months. She told us what she was doing. She was going inside, looking at herself and finding out about herself. The conflict and understanding the co Once you verbalize the conflict, it, it tends to melt away. You see what I mean? That our concepts about medicine are so different, we decided just to call it bioenergetic healing and say, well, if you go for bioenergetic healing, if you want to go for medicine, it's a choice. We're saying, well, what I've done is, is trace the mechanism for all these little therapies and saying, it all belongs to a correction of information flow in the body, which is in a, in a quantum field format, you know. And um, th that's, that's why we're, we're, we've got the red flag out, we're yelling revolution. We've got a revolutionary way of explaining all of these different branches of bioenergetic medicine. Science is about looking at knowledge and sifting through and finding out more about it and optimizing it, getting it to work better. So if we get something that works in a large percentage of cases, we've got something. And I accept that as something required by the medical people. I accept that's what has to be done. It costs a great deal of money, so we set up our institute. And uh, I believe we'll get support. So it is exciting in that now we've got, as soon as you've got the underlying science for all of these things, 
you can improve them. And all the bits that don't work, throw them out. Once you've got the science, you can get the technology. And we've just, with the Nest device, I think we've just got a very primitive, the beginning of the technology that's required to read the body field. We've already got the things to give to correct it, but we've got to get more accurate at, at reading the body field, making it work better. That's again, if you've got the science right, the technology can be fixed. Nobody's ever done it, and if we get the results and we can get information about the results out, which is what the Institute's for, um, yeah, I see if it works, people go for it and find out what the theory is a bit later, which is what you usually do. So yeah, I'm very optimistic that this will open a lot of doors. We're getting enormous support from doctors in Europe and doctors in America because they sort of say, well, where do we go next? You know, the, 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 we've got to the end of intervention. We've got to the end of, 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 of poisonous substances. What else is there? You know, and you have to bite the bullet and say, well, maybe a lot of our theories weren't right and we could revise them, have another look. And that's all we're asking is have another look and see if you want to go down the bioenergetic path. And I think as many doctors are not very happy with their position in relation to um, more or less having to hand out uh, somebody else's products. They see themselves as a, an intermediary for a company. This isn't what medicine's about. You see what I mean? So there's a lot of them pretty unhappy about what's happening. And uh, so we get support from many doctors right around the world.